Sylvia, the floor is yours. Good morning. And what a privilege to be here this morning. Last night we had great conversations uh, that we started off and I was, I was glad to be around that table where those conversations were happening. I think we saw a lot of vulnerability, authenticity, shared from the personal walks of the different leaders that we had. And uh, this morning we have another opportunity to be able to interact with Strive. I know there are many young people who have come from very far. Am I right to see Strive? <laughs> I know they're here. So Strive, you're most welcome. Karibu Thank Sana you. Nairobi. Thank you. Maybe just to start off uh, from what you've had in the previous session um, that just happened with uh, Joshua and C.S. Matiangi. I mean, any overall impressions coming out of there? Well, f well first of all, let me just say it's a, it's a great uh, privilege to be here today. I love coming to Kenya, as you know. And uh, it's almost like a second home to me. Um, I always imagined that the colonial architects who designed the city of Nairobi were the same people that designed the city of Harare. They're so incredibly similar. So I'm very much at home here. Well, you know, I was listening to the cabinet secretary this morning for those young people who were listening, there was something that really came into my heart as I was, I was thinking about what he was saying. There's, there's, a, there's a passage of scripture which says, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Anybody familiar with that? <clears throat> there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a modern way of paraphrasing that. It says, your words locate you. There's a very fascinating <clears throat> Israeli tech company which has been working on the DNA of your voice. In other words, your voice contains everything about you. Mm -hmm. The words that you speak tell us everything we need to know about you. What kind of a person you are. You can't hide from your own words. So, uh, listening to him, I heard a very sincere man who's trying extremely hard to do what is right. Mm. He was sincere in that. And um, I, I wish him very well in his efforts. Okay. Fantastic. So, I mean, we... <laughs> There's a lot that has been shared um, on this platform so far. And... Um, we all know that you're a great entrepreneur across Africa. Just picking up from that uh, previous uh, comment that you have made, what, what is the voice of Africa? What are you hearing as you go across the different countries? And what would you, or what are you working towards um, in terms of the voice that you'd want to be seen for Africa? Well, well you know, um, I come from a relatively small country in, in Africa. And one of the things that I learned very early on as my business began to, to thrive was that if I was going to get bigger, I needed to go to Africa. Sometimes when you come from big countries like Nigeria or South Africa, you, you, this, the need to, you've got such a big market at your feet that you don't think of the need to go to the rest of Africa. Uh, whereas, when you come from a small country, like a Zimbabwe or Rwanda, you're, you're conscious of Africa mm -hmm. because you need to go into a bigger market. So, at a time when it was very, it was unknown, that Africans went looking for opportunities to expand their business in other parts of Africa. I, in fact, uh, when I set out, people would ask me, is, is there a problem in your own country? Uh, I remember arriving in one African country. I, 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 won't, uh, I, won't, uh, I won't mention which one it was. But it was in this region. 
And uh, when I, so the guy asked me, at the, the, uh, says, why are you here? I said, I'm looking for business opportunities. He said, are there none in your own country? I said, I would like to invest. He said, why? Why would you like to invest? I said, so that you can be paid. He said, no, no, no. I get paid by the government. Mm. So I said, so where does your government make, get the money from? He says, they print it. Mm. I said, my friend. <laughs> I said, my friend, one of these days, you will wish you had not said that. Mm. So how many people actually see that circuit? Of, of investment and job creation, entrepreneurship. It's, it's, it's been a struggle for me for a lifetime to get people to complete that circuit. Okay. So when you go around uh, the continent, are you hearing words that are speaking life to the continent? I know many times there's a narrative, and even I think yesterday evening we had a question that came through about that bridge that we need to be able to cross between what we are seeing in the reality that we have today versus that optimistic future that we are all working towards. What are the voices that you're hearing as you go across? You know, one of the great privileges I have is that I, I, now, count, um, I now count off my hands the number of countries in Africa that I haven't visited. Mm -hmm. I am... I'm determined to visit every single African country. You, you, you are not born with a knowledge of Africa. The fact that you're born in Africa does not mean you know it. Okay? And so many people function on this idea that because I know my country, I know the rest of Africa. That, that's very dangerous. It's dangerous in anything you do to make that kind of assumption. So... I, I've, I've been traveling this continent now for more than 30 years. And I'm stunned by the change and the transformation. I'm also stunned by how much Africans are beginning to move within Africa, work with other Africans, coordinate with other Africans. It's not enough yet for the kind of change we need to see happen. Uh, but they, they, they used to be, it used to be that you would sit, be in one African country and you would ask them about a neighboring country and they would talk to them like they were with, reading a witch's brew, you know? Uh, that's moving away now. Mm. People are much more knowledgeable about the continent. But remember, our continent is still 54 sovereign countries. Uh, we have a, a deep desire to see it coordinate and work more effectively. Uh, but we mustn't forget that. And in those 54 countries, the, the, the stages of development, where countries are, the challenges that are there, are obviously going to differ. Mm, okay. When we look at the audience that we have today, and um, even looking at the interactions that we had on the SOA platform as we were preparing for this conference, there were lots of questions that were coming from the young people, and the young people from all over the, uh, the continent. And yesterday evening, we saw the young man from Nigeria, I don't know if he's in the room, who stood up and just expressed the passion that he had to learn, uh, to be inspired, and to find a better way to be able to get to that destiny that he aspires to. I have seen that um, on different uh, platforms, especially Facebook, you have a lot of interactions with the youth and with the young people. And we cannot have a conversation about generations if you're not speaking about the young people. Tell us about your passion around that. Well, you know, we, 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 there's, there's a lot of things said about Africa's youth. But... You know, I'm, a, I'm an engineer and a scientist, so I, I like numbers. The, the mean age of Africa is, is 19.7 years old. So half the population of Africa, that's the one you need to carry. Half the population of Africa are actually under the age of 20. That is the official statistic. Africa accounts for almost half 
of the world's young people. By the turn of this century, uh, we will be some 40% of the global population. And on current projections, we could be half of the world's population by the middle of the next century. Mm. So there's a lot of Africans. And there's going to be even more of us. Now, th that creates a vibrancy, but also creates a responsibility on those of us who are older. An, an, an unusual responsibility that none of us can afford not to be focused on the training and preparation of that generation. The future of this continent depends on it. So it's not something you do as a pastime. I can tell you this. Once I finish reading my Bible in the morning and I've done my prayers, the first thing I do is to look at the comments from the young people who have spoken to me over the internet, over, over the Facebook. Now I chose Facebook very methodically as a platform because I, I don't like Twitter. I don't like to be followed. Mm. <laughs> um, Why? I mean, I have nothing to be followed about. I mean, I'm an entrepreneur, so I don't want you to know where I'm doing my deals that day. <laughs> but, but, but speaking honestly, I wasn't about being followed. I was about an exchange of ideas. Um, so I do that post once a week, mm. and I want to have a serious conversation. So I'm not apologetic that I don't do it on 148 characters. Mm. Okay, I want a full conversation on an issue either which they have stimulated or asked about or something that I'm mulling over or an experience I wish to share. I don't want to be a commentator either. So when people want me to comment, that's when I'm most unlikely to comment mm. because I'm really, I have a very clear methodical thing that I'm trying to do which is to share experiences, inspire young people, warn, encourage, strengthen at the appropriate moment about what it takes to be an entrepreneur in Africa. Africa's high maintenance is tough out there for the kids. It was tough for me. I've been at it for 35 years. Okay. So to the young person who is out there, if they were to ask you, strive in your journey as an entrepreneur, as a father, as a leader, where do you draw from? Well, I just said, you know, first of all, uh, I must say, I'm respectful of every single person's faith, religion, or their right not to have it. And I'll never in the workplace come and say, come and preach to you. Okay. Each one of us has their own personal journey. I can only talk about myself, mm -hmm. okay? Because diversity is extremely important to me in my organization and to draw people from every religion, every gender, uh, people with disabilities, I've got to have them work for us. But I can only talk about myself personally, and this is uh, an open book. I am very much uh, uh, a man of faith, um, I'm very uh, passionate about the Word of God, which means I read the Bible very passionately. I have read it cover to cover more than 20 times. I used to have a program where I would read it twice a year. So I would read it just like a book. Start at Genesis and finish at Revelations. I read a little slack. I don't like reading programs that take you all over the place. I just like to methodically read it like a book. That's why it's structured like a book. Mm. Okay. <laughs> it's not a movie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so just taking up from there, you know, there's, there's reading 
and I'm, I'm here, we, we, you, you said you, you read the Bible. I don't know what other people read in the room. I, I also read the Bible a lot, and I draw a lot from there. But then there's also um, the translation of what it is that you pick um, into the reality of the life that you live each and every day. And I think for many people, uh, for many young people, especially the ones that I interact with, um, there's quite a dissonance in terms of what we hear, what we read versus what we do. So, drawing from your own personal journey, how do you bridge that? Um, I know the, the CS spoke about uh, character. He spoke about uh, the consistency in your value system, your purpose. Speaking to the, the many young people who probably represent more than 50% of the audience that is here today, how do they reduce that friction between what they want to be versus what they find themselves being? Um, and how do they actually then, um, are they able then to translate whatever it is that they read, whatever it is that they read from, into a reality of that destiny that they actually want to become? Look, what you, what you read and what you study is almost meaningless if you are not prepared to pay the price that comes with it. Um, you know that I was joking with you only last night. I said, I almost bought Telcom Kenya. Okay. But there were certain demands made on me at the time. This is 20 years ago. And I said, no, I can't. And I left. Maybe I could have owned Safaricom. <laughs> could have been my boss. <laughs> but I have no regrets. Okay. Okay. So there's a price that you paid. There's a, there's a price. And uh, you've got to, because you've got to, it's got to become live. What is it for a man to gain the whole world and to lose his soul? Mm. What does that mean to you? Mm. Okay. If you pay a bribe, you have lost your soul. Mm. It doesn't matter what you get. You have lost your soul at that point. It doesn't matter how little that bribe is. You just lost your soul. Okay? So, and, and that's all it means. It just means you have to walk away. Okay. So has, um, as, I mean... I, I, is that I, hard? <laughs> <laughs> I will invite other leaders onto the platform shortly uh, to come and interact with Strive as we also have this conversation. But I just want to ask uh, Strive, so has Africa, has Africa got soul or has Africa lost its soul? No. Especially if speaking from the perspective of African leadership. Because I want to drive the conversation towards around how are we collaborating even as we get ready to invite our other panelists. Um, have we lost our soul? No, uh, you know, Af Africa is not a person. Okay, and, and as much as we, we would like to, we will always be, it's individuals. Okay, um, they are, I, I wish there was a person called Africa that we could talk to, but we don't have that person. It's individuals, it's each one of us collectively, okay. Um, and each one of us is a leader because you might even just be a leader at school as a prefect, okay? But that's where it all begins, okay? You're a leader in the home, you're a leader in the community. You, we, we mustn't look at leadership in a single apex. That's not how society works, okay? You have the judiciary, you have the... Um, I was sitting next to one of your judges, so what a privilege. So... Uh, all of those are providing leaders, leadership in one way or another. But it's not, it's not uh, an individual called Africa with a soul. I, that's okay for the creative guys to swing like that. But I'm an engineer. An engineer looks at the unit of things. I look at the <laughs> unit of things. <laughs> but I also think there is opportunity for us to, to become a people, um, especially a people that are driven by um, a common set of values, a people that are driven by a common vision, a people that are driven by a common sense of belief 
in that which could be, which probably today may be unseen. But I think as we live and walk um, in the daily paths that we find ourselves in and in the different places that we find ourselves planted in, we can begin to create kind of one African family that can really raise up the profile of our continent. Don't you think that? Yes, but it's going to be uh, through, we, we have to commit ourselves to doing things. Um, so uh, let me give you an example. The, one of the greatest collaborations that I worked on, which many people know, I took a phone call during the Ebola crisis in West Africa. Do you recall that? And um, it was from the AU chairperson, uh, Dr. Nkosaza Nazuma. And she said to me, uh, can the private sector help? Because I have no money. And we are being asked to send healthcare workers to, uh, to West Africa. I said, how much money do you need? She says, oh, I think about 20, 30 million. I said, the private sector always has more money than government. Don't you know that? I said, so I'll tell you what. You have a room for me at the AU and I will come. And I picked up the phone and I called my friends, James Mwangi, I call all you guys, Joshua. All, I said, I need to, you to do two things. Those of you who can get to Addis, and those of you who can hold events within your home country. Bob Collimore, I call Bobby. I said, I know we compete and bump heads now and again, but we've got to do this. And within two weeks, we raised over $50 million. Okay. We sent 800 healthcare workers. And I, when, when, when I started getting the volunteers coming forward for the healthcare workers, we said, you cannot be from public health. You must come from the military. See, because the military have healthcare workers. So why don't you give us doctors and nurses from the army, not from the hospitals? And here Kenya was one of the first to prepare its group, which was over 250 Kenyans. And I went with the AU's uh, chairperson to Nigeria. They began to compete, in fact, to say, well, actually, we've got more. We sent, by the end of it, we had the largest contingent of healthcare workers there than any other, group, any other nation. All the mobile operators, you'll recall, agreed on a single mobile number into which their subscribers could call. And that was the largest amount of money raised from the public in Africa. 150 million people contributed something. Okay, and it was from one end of Africa to the other. Okay, so and then it was a part, we said to the AU chairperson, we said, when we give money, we're accountable for our money. So she says, what does that mean? I said, well, we will look after the money, and we will make the payments. She says, fine. So we set up a board of private sector leaders that paid the bills for all those people that were out there for over a year. And guess what? When it was all done, we had change. We had more than $17 million in change. And we said, it's available for your next crisis. Okay. So it is possible for us to collaborate.